this week's ACCP Emergency Medicine PRN Journal Club presentation. I'm your host, Christian Kroll, an emergency medicine and ICU pharmacist at the University of Iowa Hospital and Clinics. To view this recorded presentation, head to our YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash at ACCP EMED PRN. And for PRN members, slides can be found under the business document section on the ACCP Emergency Medicine PRN website. My name is Megan Dibron. I'm one of the PGY2 Emergency Medicine residents at University Health here at San Antonio. Today I'll be presenting on dexmedetomidine versus propofol, an effective combination with ketamine for adult procedure sedation. I don't have any financial disclosures or conflicts of interest with this presentation. Some background information, so procedural sedation and analgesia, or PSA, which I'll be referring to for the rest of this presentation, it's an act of giving medications that have both sedative, dissociative, and also pain relief to perform procedures that are likely uncomfortable for our patients without compromising their heart rate, their vitals, and also respiratory function as well. Now, there's different levels of sedation that we have for our patients that are looking at various components such as arousability, airway protection, they're also their cardiovascular as well. And so we have here, we have our minimal, we have our moderates, and then we also have our deep and dissociative. Now, looking at the differences between these four, um, we see that the depth of sedation for minimal, so these will be patients who are responsive to verbal stimulation, where their airway, spontaneous circulation, and cardiovascular functions will not be compromised. But as we move to the right, we see that a little bit more gets effective. So for their moderate, this is also termed as conscious sedation. So this is where our patients will be more purposeful in response to verbal and tactile stimulation. They may have adequate spontaneous circulation, but as far as airway and cardiovascular, those are pretty much not as affected. And then as we move to our deep sedation, this is only going to be response into painful or repeated stimulation. Airway may need to be intervened, and as far as spontaneous circulation and cardiovascular, this is usually maintained. For our last one, our dissociative, so this is our deepest sedation that we have. So these patients will be unarousable even if we are doing this uh, painful stimulus. Airway is often required, and then also spontaneous circulation is also impaired. And now for the purpose of this presentation, we'll be focusing on the deep sedation. And then as far as the levels of procedures that we have with our patients, so going from left to right, we have increasing levels of discomfort, but this also does depend on our patient, um, their pain tolerance, and also the type of procedure. So as we go from the left to the right, we do see that the probably least uh, painful, least discomfort would be our lacerations, um, as well as our dislocation reductions. And as we move to the right, we see secondary, we have our biopsies, we have our fracture reductions, and then the most painful ones, our most discomfort, would be our lumbar punctures, chest tube um, insertions, as well as bronchoscopy and endoscopies. As far as the medications that we have available for PSA, we, these are the three I want to focus on, but we do have other agents available, such as Atomidate, benzodiazepines, and opioids, but I'd like to focus on these three for the purpose of this trial. For, so for the first medication we have available, we have our dexmedetomidine. This is an alpha-2 agonist. With these, we may see some transient hypertension, but typically we see that hypotension and bradycardia. And then this is typically dosed 0. 0.5 to 1 mics per kilo over 10 minutes. And then with our ketamine, this is our N-methyl D-aspartate antagonist, or NMDA. And with this, since we have the pathomimetic effects, and we see that increased heart rate, increased blood pressure, as well as apnea and secretions. Now, the dosing for this is 1 to 2 milligrams per kilo over 1 to 2 minutes, but there's been a lot of studies that combining it with propofol in a 1 to 1 mixture as at a reduced dose of 0.375 to 0.75 mg per kilo. And now our last agent is propofol. So this one does have multiple mechanisms of action, but I'd like to focus on these two, our gamma aminobutyric butyric acid agonist and our NMDA antagonist. And with this, we'll see hypotension, bradycardia in our patients. And the dosing for this is 0.5 to 1 mg per kilo. And again, combined with ketamine and that one-to-one -one mixture, we do see that reduced dosing. For PSA, our ideal agent or agents, we want something to be quick onset, 
short duration and a quick recovery time. So for our agents that we have, looking on the left for our onset, our ketamine and propofol are fairly quick onset of about 30 seconds. And then we see dexmedetomidine acting fairly slower, about five to 10 minutes. And then for duration, it is a little bit different. So propofol, the duration is three to 10 minutes, followed by dexmedetomidine at six minutes, and then ketamine five to 10 minutes. So with these agents, we do want to optimize the pharmacokinetics to be able to have our patients most comfortable during the procedure. I wanted to dive into a couple articles that kind of looked at the different dosing mechanisms, the different agents that we have available. So the first one done in 2016, this is by Ferguson and colleagues. This is also known as the poker trial. So this was a randomized double blind trial that looked at adult patients requiring deep procedural sedation in the ED. So they were looking at two different interventions, ketofol, which is a combination of ketamine and propofol and propofol. And now their dosing schematic was a little bit different. Instead of the mix per kilo, they did more of a weight base and volume. So initially, they gave a bolus of 0.05 mLs per kilo, followed by aliquots of 0.025 every 60 seconds, with the main outcome looking at occurrence of respiratory adverse events. They found really there was no difference between the two, and that there was an increased incidence of hypotension with our propofol group. The next trial, this was done in 20, 2022 by Singh and colleagues. So this looked at specifically adult patients undergoing ERCP. It included 84 patients, half receiving ketodex, which is ketamine and dexmedetomidine. And for here, they would receive a loading dose of one mic per kilo over 10 minutes, followed by ketamine 0.5 mix per kilo. And then our ketofol group this was also 42 patients as well, and they looked at the mean SpO2. They found that the ketodex group had a higher SpO2, also had less lesser incidence of respiratory effects, and was in a safe alternative to ketofol. But keep in mind, this was a safety study. Now, for our article today by S. Million and colleagues, this was a prospective double-blind randomized trial. It was conducted between September 2022 and February of this year. It was done at two different Iranian hospitals, Alzara and Kashani. These are both educational hospitals with annual visits of greater than 140,000 patients. And for the interventions they utilized, they had we had three different groups. We had the ketodex group, which was ketamine one mg per kilo and dexmedetomidine 0.7 mics per kilo. And then we also had our ketofol group. This was ketamine 0.5 mg per kilo and propofol 0.5 mg per kilo. And lastly, ketamine 1 mg per kilo was our ketamine alone. I do want to kind of set the scene for how these medications were blinded. So they had a nurse that was not involved in the administration that would mix them up in a single syringe and QS them to 20 mLs, and they would cover the syringe so that you wouldn't be able to see if it was propofol or not. And then these patients were wheeled into a sedation room where there was one physician that was in charge of the airway and one physician in charge of the medications. All of these were pushed over four minutes. Who they included were adult patients requiring PSA in the ED. They also had an ASA or the American Society of Anesthesiology class of one to three. So this is a scale of one to six. The higher the scale indicates the more comorbidities and the more severity of their illness. And then they also had to have a visual analog score greater than four. Um, so this is a pain scale from zero to 10, with 10 indicating the most pain. And who they excluded is any patients that received a sedative or analgesic within 24 hours, any patients who had severe organ dysfunction or systemic illness, or if they had persistent hemodynamic instability. So otherwise, overall healthy patients. As far as the patients they included, they had a total of 150 patients assessed for eligibility, but 15 did decline to participate for unknown reasons. But at the end of all this, they had 45 patients in each group. For primary outcomes, they were looking at induction time. So this was the time from the first dose of the medication was given to a, to a RAS of negative four that was achieved. And then their other outcome was recovery time. So this was from the time the last dose of the medication was given to when the patient was alert and oriented and able to be arousable by minimal uh, stimulation. As far as secondary outcomes, they were looking at cardiorespiratory variables. So those would be our heart rate, our systolic blood pressure, as well as our O2 saturations. They were also seeing if the patients needed additional doses of ketamine if they weren't adequately sedated, and then incidence of recovery, and lastly, adverse events. For the statistics, they used a prevalence of side effects of 13% to calculate that 42 in each group needed to power the study of 80% with a 95% confidence interval. 
As far as statistics, they utilize a chi-square test for the categorical data, the ANOVA for the numerical data, and the paired t-test as well. For the baseline characteristics of our patients, their mean age was uh, 38 years, with the majority of them, of them being male, 76%. The mean weight was 72 kilos. And as far as uh, hemodynamic status, they were pretty stable with the solid blood pressure greater than 120 and O2 sats greater than 95%. But for more information on baseline characteristics, I'd like to refer you to page 98, table 1. Now let's talk about the outcomes. So for the duration of the procedure across the board was about 12 minutes. But when we would look at our primary outcomes of induction time and recovery time, we see that the keto fall group was 1.4 minutes faster. So it's statistically significant, but if we think about the clinical significance, maybe not. And then for recovery time, we see that the keto fall group was 8.3 minutes faster compared to the keto dex group. And then as far as the additional dosings for the medications, the ketamine alone group did require more. So to sum up the whole table, what we saw is that there was an increased induction time and increased recovery time of the keto dex versus our ketamine and ketofol. And then with these combination agents, which is our ketodex and ketofol, we saw that there was a need for a lesser need for that additional ketamine or midazolam in those patients. For our secondary outcomes, we saw that with ketamine, there was that increased heart rate, increased blood pressure, and then increased induced recovery agitation, which they defined as RAS greater than one. This is something that we would typically see, you know, as ketamine has that sympathomimetic effects. And then with our ketofol, as we know, propofol has some has antiemetic effects. So there is decreased nausea and vomiting in our ketofol group. As far as our respiratory events, we saw that there was an increased oxygen desaturations in our ketofol group. But on the other hand, in our ketodex group, there was an increased incidence of apnea, laryngospasm, and assisted ventilation. But the bagging time was less than three minutes. And all of these patients, none of them required intubation. So for critiques of this study, for the strengths, the trial design was our gold standard randomized control trial. They also looked at comparative statistics, so we were able to see how all three groups compared to each other. So ketodex versus ketofol, as well as just ketamine alone. And then lastly, to reduce any subjectivity, they utilized standardized scales, such as our ASA, VAS, and then our RAS. But there were quite a few limitations. So the biggest one is there was no analgesic or sedative within 24 hours. Typically with these patients, if they're not able to, you know, adequately, quickly get to the PSA, they will get a dose of an analgesic while waiting in the ER. Secondly, there was a difference in the ketamine dosing. So the keto dex group, that one had one mg per kilo and the ketamine as well. But our ketofol group had half the dosing. So this could greatly affect our primary outcomes. Thirdly, we had a RAS of negative four, so they were targeting a deep sedation. And then they really didn't report the success of procedure. So one of the goals of PSA is to reduce OR time, decrease admission, but we don't really know if these really um, affected those. And then lastly, there was no end tidal monitoring for oxygen saturation. So with over 50% of these patients requiring supplemental oxygen, by seeing the end tidal, we may have been able to prevent those DSATs a lot quicker. So for the conclusions, the author concluded these three takeaways, is that the addition of dexmedetomidine can mitigate the cardiovascular effects of ketamine, so the tachycardia and the hypertension. Ketodex did have a, did have a lower need for supplemental oxygen. And lastly, ketodex and ketofol are safe and effective combinations. But for my takeaways, what I found is that from ketofol, it did have a shorter recovery time. However, it did differ in ketamine doses. So this one was 0.5 mg per kilo. So this could have in turn favored that shorter recovery time. Secondly, these combination agents, so our ketodex and ketofol, greatly reduced the need for those rescue agents of ketamine and midazolam. And then lastly, while ketodex is still trying to find its niche in PSA, it may be beneficial in those who cannot tolerate tachycardia, such as heart failure, but I'd still like to see other trials looking at the clinical efficacy studied at the half dose of dexmedetomidine and kind of seeing if these helped in the success of procedures. And lastly, I'd like to thank my mentor and my RPC, Luke Neff, and then my RPD, Ellen Robinson. And with that, I'd like to open it up to questions. If you have enjoyed this presentation content and would like to hear more, subscribe via your favorite podcasting app. Additionally, make sure to check out our YouTube page for all recorded presentations. Thank you for listening to this week's ACCP Emergency Medicine. Join us
weekly for review and discussion and journal articles and This podcast provides general information only. It does not offer individualized medical or professional health care services, including pharmaceutical advice. The contents and materials in the podcast are not intended to be a substitute for inpatient pharmaceutical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. And the use of the contents and materials in the podcast does not constitute a pharmacist-patient relationship. As a result, the information in and materials linked to this podcast are applied at the user or patient's own risk. Users or patients should consult their physician or personal health care professional. The user or patient should not ignore or delay seeking care because of something they heard on this podcast. In case of an emergency, the user or patient should contact their physician, call 911, or go to the nearest medical emergency facility. The views and statements expressed on this podcast are those of the host and guest and should not be interpreted to reflect the official position or policy of ACCP or the Emergency Medicine PRN.